making 10% in a month is not good trading. Making 5%, you know, average over the year, every single month, is That's phenomenal good trading. trading. Yeah. Why wouldn't you reward that? I, okay. I'm not a big fan of demo. I'm not a big fan of paper trading. I think you need to be taking heat, you know, and, and whatever it is you're doing, even if it's only a five grand account or something like that, take take the heat and, and feel the pain from it. If you're desperate for the next trade to come, it tells me one thing, you have told yourself that you're gonna win. Right, you've told yourself it's going to be a winning trade that's why you want it to come if you thought the next trade was going to be a losing trade you would hope it never comes right so True. going right so instead of expecting the trade to win or expecting the trade to lose you know expecting the trade to win and you can't wait for the next trade and you're hinging everything on it or expecting the trade to lose and you're terrified of it coming just neutralize it have no expectations of the next trade just recognize the outcome of the next trade is not dependent upon anything. It's just random. The first hand experience I had of it from July 2022 until January 2023, I was negative every single month. We had guys within, you know, three, four months doing five figures and payouts from prop firms. We had a number of guys who had who had come in, they'd done X, Y, and Z education. And within a matter of months, they're they're taking home five figures, which you know wow. we're relatively public about the kind of results that our members are doing. Why did Kyle block you on Twitter? Why did Jade Cat block you? What's up, traders? Welcome back to the Day Trading Show. My name is Austin Silver. I'm your host, and I really appreciate you being here today. I've got a special episode. This is part two, round two, with Sam Cavanaugh. Sam is a incredible man. He's about to have his first child. So we talk a little bit about fatherhood, but he gives us a lot of insight into not just getting funded and how he's helping traders get funded, but specific data that you should be tracking and understanding when it comes to your own trading in order to move your career forward. We talk about how a lot of traders are spinning their wheels, doing maybe the wrong things, not the most uh, profitable things, but maybe things that make them feel productive. So if that sounds like you, maybe you're kind of at a point in your journey where you're looking for clear direction. Sam's going to give that to you today. So enjoy the episode. Make sure you're subscribed. I've got links to our sponsors, links to everything down in the description. And I just really appreciate you guys tuning in. I've got a lot of in-person interviews coming up in the next few weeks. I've got two really good ones coming up next week. So we're going to hit you with Sam and I've got some more coming for you. So stay subscribed, stay tuned and enjoy today's podcast. All right, traders, I know with the FTMO and my Forex Fund stuff happening over the last year, if you're in the US and you wanna get funded, it's getting a little confusing on who to trust. Today's sponsor, Top One Trader, is the firm that I am trading with and the firm that I think you should check out as well. For being a listener of the videos here on my channel, you get a 20% off discount as many times as you wanna use it on your next funding challenge if you use the link and the discount code down below. So again, if you're in the US or if you're international, Top One Trader is the firm you need to check out. They have the most competitive pricing, plus with my 20% off discount, you really can't beat it. They've already got the regulation in place. They've got great customer support. I love the CEO and the founder, it's a no brainer. So check out the link in the description, use the discount code. Now let's get back to the video. Traders, we are back with another episode, round two with my brother from another mother, <laughs> Mr. Sam Cavanaugh. What's up, Sam? Good to be here. Glad to be back. We have a lot of things to catch up on, Sam. It's been too long. And honestly, your last episode got a lot of views, which I'm very thankful for, got a lot of attention. We said some things that people agreed with. We said some things that people disagreed with. I'm sure that's going to happen again today. Look at him rubbing the eyes already. Oh, fuck. But it's going to be good, bro. I'm really looking forward to this. So first, congratulations on becoming a dad here in the next couple of days. That's super exciting, bro. Have you... Uh, I asked you this before, but have you given any time to saying like, I'm going to clock out of trading? I think people want to know that when they hear, you know, oh, a trader's having a kid, you know, because they all know we work from home. They think that we're going to clock out. But why don't we talk about that first? What's your plan with the kid and, and working from home? How are you going to balance that? Well, look, so here's the thing. My day-to-day -day work is not trading. You know, my trading takes place at the end of my day at 10 p.m. here in the U.K., it's all done via pending orders. I'm at a stage of my trading. I have my systems and everything to a stage where so much of my trading, um, you know, is sort of handled in the sense that all of my systems, I've obviously got 15 assets that I look at. All of my systems are coded to send alerts to our Discord server. Those alerts only come through at 10 p.m. at night. That's the only time I get setups. 
those setups are placed via pending orders and any management I can, I've got coded to trading view alerts to send to my phone as well. So I maybe spend 30 minutes sitting looking at my charts in the evening and throughout the next day, I'll get alerts if stuff fills, if management opportunities uh, arise and all that kind of stuff. So I spend so little time in the markets that I don't need to take time off. You know, around 10 p.m. at night, you know, I can nip, nip to my desk for half an hour to get things set up. And throughout the day, I can manage it from my phone. So I don't need to take time away from trading. The business side of things, you know, we've got people, we've got, you know, an agency that run most of our like marketing and stuff. We've got um, guys that handle, you know, a guy that now handles bringing people onto the courses, the interviews that we run. You know, I've got guys managing my social media, guys manage my website. So, I mean, I'm feeling a bit redundant in all honesty. I'm already feeling like I, I've i got hardly anything to do on a day-to-day -day basis. So, It's a great answer. I think uh, now you got me thinking, why the big push this year in the business? I was going to ask you first, like, have you had any regrets? Because last time we spoke, we talked about leaving the office and going working from home. You had the setup there. Have you had any regrets about that? It doesn't seem like that because outsourcing all of this stuff, freeing up your own schedule, this is the beauty of being an entrepreneur and being a trader, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. So the, you know, the office side of things, great banter and, you know, you, you develop so much as a trader when you're around other people and you're hearing other ideas bouncing off each other. And really the office and running the trading floor was the foundation of the professional education that we run now, because all of those ideas, we developed those ideas in 2020 and 2021. We put them into practice in 2022, forward testing them. And in 2023, we launched the education, you know, based on those principles. So it was like, you know, years of preparation on the trading floor, forward testing and actually trading it live before then rolling out education on it. So, you know, the, the trading floor was amazing in that sense is amazing in the sense of the social aspect and that kind of thing but in all honesty the business the business has never done better than it is now it's great you know we've we've effectively we've cut i mean our expenses now we, we're not paying our, our biggest office we we're paying five grand a month for so and staff and all that kind of stuff associated costs computer kit whatever that was running an office was super expensive now that we're away from the trading floor and everything's done remotely, costs are less, more money can be allocated to areas that it needs to be. And I'm more focused on the business rather than being in the business. I can now work on the business. And that's been, you know, it's been, it's really changed a lot. I think that's definitely something I have to work on going into this year. My wife gets on me all the time. She's like, I know you got into this business because you love trading and helping people, but like at some point you got to get your schedule back because between the mm -hmm. coaching, my own trading, doing the podcast, managing our employees, it does take a lot away from my time. Like it's like my whole day. It's like a job. I think you, this is funny. We're talking about this. Tom Dante tweeted yesterday, too many people are glor glorifying trading. It's just another job, you know? So I think you're doing it the right way by trying to be working more on the business, not in the business. That's a very key like entrepreneur buzzword saying, right? Every entrepreneur starts in the business and then you want to eventually be working on it. Do you have any advice for people like me that are trying to get better at working on the business rather than in the business? Yeah. I mean, so I tried this, I've tried this over the years to try and get people who can work in the business and so I can work on the business. The biggest mistake I made was hiring people because I liked them, because they were mates with me, because they were good traders. Those types of people, those aren't the types of people that you want to be like managing customer service, managing your marketing, all that kind of stuff, because they're not specifically qualified in that area. It's just nepotism. You're just giving them the job because you love them, right? That's that's never going to work out. You know, okay, the, the relationship may last and be fine, but you have an expectation and you just need to be willing to pay what it costs to get the result that you're looking for. So hiring experience hiring people who have been doing it for a long time i can bring on someone who's you know just just come out of a course on you know ads and marketing or i can just go to an agency it's going to cost me double the amount but i can literally give you know i now have a, a web guy and and this agency and i can literally give them the logins for any of my stuff and say can you go and do this and they'll just go and handle it um so just finding the right people is such a big thing but also I know, being that's able to let go 
That's you know? what they all, everybody says that people, it's always about people, people, people like entrepreneurs are always talking about, you got to build people. I interviewed this guy that's running one of these funding companies and he's had success in network marketing and stuff. And he always was, he kept saying in the interview, it's about the people. It's about the people. I get that. But like, like you just said, is it the people like to go out and hire an agency for double or triple the price? Or do you find a guy that's motivated, get him the course, get him the information and kind of work him internal? Which one have you had more success with? The second option's cheaper. Of course. Um, because, you know, you're hiring someone that's not experienced and you're effectively training them up in a sense. That's always going to be the the more cost-effective way to do it. But it's going to take a lot longer. It could take right. six months. You might have to say, well, Easy. in six months, we'll, we'll be where we want to be. But if you hire from experience, you get results straight away. And you can always bring someone on, you know, in the meantime and let them kind of get developed and gain experience and that kind of thing so that they can then take over and you've got someone in house who's worked with you for a while and that kind of thing. But delegation is a big thing. I, you know, your company better than anyone who works for you. I know my company better than anyone who works for me. So I have a standard that is quite hard for a lot of people to attain to because it's my baby, you know, it's, it's my, my vision, my dream. And you, you're never going to be able to sell people on that, like no matter what you do, especially- They're never going to care about it as much as you do. If you're in a, a fixed location, you can get that. You can absolutely build the company culture and all that kind of stuff. When people are remote and they're just kind of free agents, they're never going to buy into the vision as much as, as much as you. So in a sense, there are areas where you need to say like, I need to just let them do their thing. It might not be exactly how I would do it, but I need to let them do their thing. And an example of that would be like, you know, from when I started in the business, I would do all of the videos, I would do all of the photo editing, I would do all of the emails, I would do all of the website stuff, everything. So I like the way I do things. So when you bring on someone who's going to now start editing your videos for you and that kind of thing, they're going to do it differently. You just need to suck it up. And if the audience likes it, you just go, okay, well, the audience likes it. I'm paying them to do it. I'll let them do what they want to do rather than mimic what I've been doing. Great point. Um, both both points, very valid. All right, good good stuff for the entrepreneurs that are listening. Let's go back to day <laughs> trading. So um, I want to talk first about that service that I've seen you talk a little bit about on Instagram, but I do think it's very important that our audience hears about this. So you mm. are offering to help guys pass funding challenges. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, so it's actually it's actually a, quite an interesting one because funding wasn't something I made a big push for really until 2023. I would yeah, do I the odd challenge and that kind mm -hmm. of thing. But mm -hmm. in 2023, I set out to just acquire as much funding as possible. And it, I think what sparked it was probably at the end of 2022, a firm contacted me and said, can we give you an account if you make a YouTube video? And I was like, yeah, sure. Okay, I'll, I'll try this out. And when I started to see there were some other options out there, I thought maybe there are some good alternatives to like FTMO and the kind of giants in the space. So I'm going to just try and get funding and review these firms. Now, as we progressed our education as well, what and even running the trading floor, what I would see is you would get guys that could trade well, but they couldn't pass funding challenges because there was time limits on the funding challenges on almost all of them at that point in time. So you would have guys who could make a nice five six percent average every month and so they don't pass ftmo because it's a 10 percent target and then they roll into the next month and okay they they maybe make 10 percent in that month and pass it but the next month they only make three percent and they don't pass a verification and all this and so i saw guys who were great traders scaling their own personal funds nicely and that kind of thing but unable to pass funding challenges and I don't know if you remember when I was at the Financial Magnets London Summit, when they invited me to go and speak on that panel alongside FTMO and that kind of thing. The biggest gripe I had, and I made it very, very clear, was the time limits. I was saying, there's the CEO of all these prop firms sitting next to me, and I'm saying to them in front of this audience, you can't tell traders that you want them to trade well, and that your desire is to fund the best traders and all that, but not reward good trading, just reward you know, um, uh, you can make this X amount of percent in a month. Making 10% in a month is not good trading. Making 5%, you know, average over the year, every single month, is phenomenal good trading. trading. Yeah. Why wouldn't you reward that? And 
you know, interestingly, about four months after that, um, they all started don't... dropping the time limit. <laughs> I'm not saying I'm directly involved, but anyway, um, so that was always my kind of gripe. And then when I saw that there were some great alternative firms that would allow someone like KB to come in and trade on behalf of one of their students and pass a challenge, I'm like, okay, well, maybe we can do this. If the firm's good and they pay out, okay, maybe it's not FDMO. If they're good and they pay out, we can actually pass funding challenges for guys who we know can trade. So I started this out by, you know, I had a contact in Canada who was willing to handle all of that for me. Um, and he said, look, you know, I, I'm willing to run this this service for you and help you out with this. And so, you know, between one thing and another, we got to the stage where we can actually now start passing people's accounts for them, get them done pretty quickly. And we can offer things like, you know, if we fail for whatever reason, we'll give you a full refund, we'll buy you another account and that kind of thing. And so I just started soft launching it to my community and it was via an application process. We don't want like total beginners coming through who are just going to blow the account once they get it. And I decided toward the end of last year, maybe start offering it to my broader audience every so often. But again, you know, if my any of my broader audience want in on that, they have to jump on an interview call with me. I have to speak to them for 15 minutes. Well, it won't be me now going forward. It's, you know, it's a, one of our team, Lewis, is going to be handling those. But we have to assess that they're, they're not just like, you know, a beginner and all that kind of stuff. And do you have stats that you could share on like the success rate of you guys doing this for other people? We've never had anyone walk away without a, a past funding account. Okay, That's there's been a couple of times where we didn't, there's been a couple of times where we haven't passed first time. Okay. But- and then you what know, happens? Do you do they have to pay again or do you do it for them? They they then get it for free. So Got it. If, if for whatever reason we didn't pass, the fee that they would pay us, we give them back. And then we buy them an account, you know, out of our own money and pass it. So if if we fail it, we end up, you know, losing money on that, but it keeps the customer happy and they come back to us. So last year between our community and a handful of people outside of our community, we done about $30 million in funding wow. Wow. for, for, you know, those who came through that service. So it's been really good. That's amazing. And I think that it'll be good for some of the, like you said, like a broader audience to hear about this, because I think that um, there are a lot of good traders out there, like you said, that put themselves in a challenge, not, not only, you know, they got rid of the time for anything, but it, it does create a lot of stress for people sometimes that are, it does. Because I think about it like I have guys in the coaching program that are new traders, like year one to three, right? Like they're still mm -hmm. in the beginning phase of this. They're good traders, but because they're in a challenge, they feel this pressure, this this anxiety that's, that's right. unneeded. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, for a lot of a lot of good traders, guys who have nailed the concept, guys who are trading consistently, a lot of them are trading on small capital or they're trading on demo. Now, the transition from, you know, demo to now something that you put a thousand pounds into or from a you know thousand pound account to now something where you could literally lose a thousand pounds in a matter of a couple of bad trades. What it does is it, it puts the pressure on and they have a million and one things to think about as it is in their trading. It's just an unnecessary pressure. This is why the traditional prop firm route, which is what we try to do through the trading floor was if you can show a consistent track record of you know six to twelve months, we'll give you money. Um, and however, that's not a very profitable business model in terms of the funding past challenge and um, process, which is obviously extremely profitable. Yeah. When uh, let's transition another another second here, because we're talking about prop firms. Why did Kyle block you on Twitter? Why did Jade Cat block you? What did you, what, every time we do a podcast, Sam, I got to ask you about it. First it was Madison, then you guys squared up. Then I, I don't get why he wouldn't show them IFX book because we all know he's invested a ton of money into this stuff, but he's made right. more. It's probably, I'm going to, I'm going to see him and I'm going to have to ask him the same reason. Like, why did you block Sam? But I like what, to me, it's like, okay, but your stats are bad, Kyle. Just say it doesn't matter. I just wanted to get paid out. Like, that's all he'd have to say. You know what I mean? Yeah, so I actually don't know what happened there. The funny thing about um, the situation with myself and Mads is I think she actually, she did definitely unblock me because I see her tweets come up and sometimes she replies to my stuff and we have a bit of a bit of back and forth. She 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 loves me really. Um, and but with with the Jade Cap thing, to be fair, I didn't really 
I wasn't really super familiar with who he was. Okay. I don't really follow a lot of people on Twitter or anything like that. I don't follow a lot of people on YouTube. I don't follow traders as it is. You know, I kind of keep, you know, my the people who I'm following to to a very small number because I'm not really all that interested. I know that sounds bad. It's not an ego thing. No, 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 it's, it's not. It's just you're doing your own thing. It's like a lot of people. I'm, I'm, I'm doing my own thing. And what I find is whenever some kind of big personality starts to bleed over into my space, it always ends in tears because, you know, for whatever reason. But I never actually directly asked um, Kyle, Kyle for, yeah, yeah, Kyle for his MyFX book. So okay. when I, I I just noticed someone had, someone had posted something and I clicked on his account to see, oh, who's this guy? And it said, this person has blocked you. And I thought, okay, I saw he was, you know, associated with a few people. And I said, I just put out like a tongue in cheek tweet, like, I need to stop asking, you know, gurus for their MyFX book. Got now, it. I, my That's me making the assumption that because I had asked a couple of people for a, a verified track record in the past, like, month, that people are just, like, blocking me. Now, I I don't know 100% if that's the case. I doubt it is. I have no reason to doubt that the guy's a, a great trader. I saw he had some phenomenal payouts um, over the past couple of years, and that's fantastic. But when I put out that tweet, it was just a bit of a tongue-in-cheek thing. I understand. People were commenting on it like people were talk commenting on it like people have obviously followed me and him like, bro, like this guy's legit, and I'm like, yeah, I'm not saying he's not. I'm just having a laugh. Yeah, and I got you. Be before you knew it, so many people were taking it bad, and I was like, so I just took the tweet down. Yeah, but then he posted a tweet, I believe, and tagged me in it like, you know, uh, something for the haters or something like that, and I saw it and I was like, yeah, whatever. So I just like, you know all the notifications are coming up. So I just like clicked on the three little dots, leave conversation. So I'm like, I have, I have no interest in reading this. And that's and why I, I asked about it. Yeah. And then people were like tweeting me like, why did you block him? I'm like, I, I've not blocked anyone. Like, It's so I'm funny, just... bro. When it's like, the, it's the real housewives of prop firm Twitter space. You know what I'm saying? Sam blocked yeah. Kyle. And I totally agree. I think I, I've had Kyle on the podcast. He's clearly... Uh, one of the best right now at getting paid out by these prop firms. And that's why I had to ask you, I was curious. Cause like, yeah, maybe I thought maybe his stats didn't look good and that's why he wouldn't want to do that maybe, but the payouts can't argue with the payouts. So you can see the money in and the money out. So, and that brings me to my bigger question. Oh, sorry. Good. Were you going to say something? Yeah. I mean, at, at the end of the day, you know, the, at the end of the day, the objective is to make money, right. To, for prop firms anyway. You know, I, I say it like this, and I, this is what I teach to my students. With my own personal funds, top priority is to preserve capital. Top priority. You know, up there, you know, close second is to trade well. Now, you might say, well, she's not going to trade well first. Well, if you're preserving capital, if you're not preserving capital, you're not going to have anything to trade well in the first place. So when it's my own capital, you know, preserve capital, trade well, make money comes third. With prop firms, it's completely flipped. Top objective, trade my system well. Second objective, make money. Preserving capital almost doesn't even come into the picture. Now, that doesn't mean to say I use ridiculous risk or anything like that. But with prop firms, the objective for me is just is just to melt the cow, if you, if, you, if you get me. It's just to take cash from these prop firms. You spend a bit of money, you get the account. You want to just milk it for everything you can get. So he's done that, you know, I, I see that clearly, he's done that. Um, does getting payouts and lots of payouts necessarily mean good trading? No, no. it doesn't have to. And I don't Correct. have a gripe about that either, yeah. you know, but what I would say is if, if someone's funded with $5 million and they make a million dollars in payouts in three years, is it, you know, it's still a million dollars, is yeah, but that's incredible? a 20%, right, it's 20% over three years, that breaks down, yeah. Yeah, is it, is it incredible trading performance? I no. wouldn't, I'd say it's good trading performance, I wouldn't say it's, it's incredible, good. right? but he's ticked, he's ticked the box, make money, Yeah, and he's made a million dollars, fantastic, right. you know, right. and, and hats off hats off to him. I hope that, uh, I hope that that inspires people to see just how much you can do if you have a decent amount of capital, and if you can just turn up and trade well. You know what I mean? So, yeah, a hundred percent with your own approach to getting funded, say we're talking to somebody that doesn't want to, 
use your service or can't afford to have you guys pass it for them. They bought one challenge. They want to get this thing done. Can you speak on that for a second? Just some advice to the guys that have not passed the challenge yet. They're still trying to get over. Because you know, once you pass the first one, confidence goes up. You finally did it. You feel like you can do it. And then they typically people will pass more than one. So that's why I'm saying yeah. like the advice to the first time guy that hasn't passed one yet, what would you say are some even like applicable tactics to getting it done? Yeah, very, very simply. Um, you know, I would give perhaps three pointers on this. Okay. The top one I would say is make sure you're trading consistently for at least three to six months on real money, not on demo, on real money. Why? Because what that shows is if you can trade consistently on your own money, even if you're not super profitable, just consistently, even if it's a break-even period or slightly down, if you can eat those losses you know, for, you know, a couple of months, winning and losing, and you can manage that, do, doing it on your own money. That that tells me that, you know, you're you're pretty much ready to go and put some bigger money on the line with, with a prop firm. The other thing, you know, one of the other top things that I'd be looking for is affordability. So, look, I'm going to be honest, if you've got two grand sitting in your savings account, going for funding is not something you want to do right now. You know, especially if that funding challenge is going to cost you $500 or $1,000, you don't want to be going broke trying to get rich, you know, I mean, effectively. So you need to be wise. You wouldn't, you know, whether it's trainers or a computer or a new phone or a night out or whatever it is, make sure it's affordable. People often see funding as like you're paying to get money, but you're not. You're paying for the opportunity to to participate in a challenge to get to to get that funding. And at the end of the day, how many people two weeks before MFF went down, maybe spent the last of their savings on a challenge and they're 1% away from passing and then the firm goes under, you know, that, that can happen. Now, in terms of practical advice, don't buy one challenge, buy four. So if you've got $1,000 to spend on challenges, instead of getting one that costs $1,000, get three that costs two fifty. Why? Because effectively you're not going to you can't guarantee that you're going to pass first time nor should you expect to you might and if you do you've got three more to potentially pass in in quick succession but effectively what you should be doing is setting the challenge and using a higher risk approach to what you would use on your normal funds remember the objective is to hit the target the objective isn't to keep the account forever so shoot for the target if you fail, set the next one. If you fail, set the next one, right? If you fail on the, the fourth one, you probably shouldn't be taking challenges in the first place, right? Because you've, you've had four attempts back to back and you've still, you've blown every single one. Right. That would go back to the first point of making sure you're ready. But setting a handful of challenges back to back, once you fail, or even if you pass that one, go on and set the next one. What you'll often find is that the distribution of wins and losses in trading is relatively random but what you tend to find is that you know winners when you hit a, a a winning patch you tend to have a decent winning streak when you hit a losing patch you tend to have a pretty horrible losing patch now when i say it's random that could happen in july it could happen in december i don't see any data in my historical data to suggest that there's any kind of sequential pattern right. but so so that's that's a bit of practical advice because great advice. I would see guys I would see guys like you know who perhaps were on the trading floor go for an FTMO and they would pass the challenge, right? And it comes on to verification. And they'd say, Look, I'm not gonna set the verification. I'm gonna start it at the, the start of next month and come in fresh, take two weeks off, and then they fail the verification. If they just sat it straight back to back, they would have passed. Or likewise, they have a you know, they blow the account. And they say, I'm going to start fresh next month. If they had just started on the day that they lost the account, they would have actually passed the next one. So I'm a big believer in set aside over this next couple of months, I'm going to be going for funding. I'm going to get four accounts and I'm going to set them back to back. That's what I would say. Great advice. How do you feel about trade copiers? Do you feel like someone... Maybe let's go to some advice on a guy that has already passed his first challenge and now he maybe failed, got some payouts and lost the challenge, whatever, lost the account. Maybe he wants to scale his business now. He's like, I've done this once. I don't want to have to do this 10 times. 
Should I use a trade copier now? Take one challenge as the master account, 100K, whatever, and then copy it to a couple of 250s and a couple of other hundreds, put it across a bunch of companies. That way I'm diversified. Do you think that's a smart idea? Or do you think get that one account, milk it, milk it, milk it, fail, lose it, and then get to the next account? The sponsor of today's video is me. ASFX TV. With ASFX TV, if you don't know what it is, you can trade live with me and our team of funded full-time traders all week long. We offer live sessions in the New York session and live sessions in the London session. All of the videos are recorded and stored on our platform so you can rewatch them in case you can't be there live. But if you can be there live, we have a new live chat feature which allows you to send in questions, ask me what I'm thinking, give me a markup so I can give you feedback, and basically anything in between. So again, if you're looking to get funded, if you're looking to take your trading to the next level, you've got to take in new information. The best way to do that is through ASFX TV. We have four funded full-time traders holding your hand through the live market every day. So click the link down below, check out the free trial, and I'll see you on the next stream. So I'm, I'm a big believer in scaling funding. I would be relatively agnostic on that idea that you've just put forth there with regards to, you know, setting a handful on a trade copier at once. If you can afford it, why not? You know, if you've got 10 grand sitting there and you want to, you know, you want to go and get funded, then do exactly what I said, but just, you know, set three at a time, for example, with different firms on a trade copier, those three fail, connect the next three, set them, those three fail, connect the next three, set them. Now, yeah, as I say, I'm relatively agnostic about that. I've not thought into it super, you know, a super amount. I certainly do that. You know, I, yeah. I know problem with setting a handful of challenges at the same time. I think it's like you said, can you afford it? One of the guys that I'm yeah. coaching right now, he can afford it. One of the guys I'm coaching right now, he can't afford it. So it's just going to be a slightly different approach. I agree with that 100%. Do you, since you mentioned data, I have some questions about like what you've seen in your traders, in your own trading, even in 2023. Do you feel that there is a certain day of the week that traders should avoid? You always hear the cliche, don't trade Mondays and Fridays. What are your thoughts on this? Does the data back it up, you know? I saw a trader on Twitter who I'm not going to name, um, but he said, you know, I've been looking back over my account and what I've noticed is that I lose money on Wednesdays. Great. Um, he says, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at my other accounts and see if I also lose money on Wednesdays on them and I'm going to remove Wednesdays from my trading. Okay. You say that to your, your average trader, they're going to go, what, that is the most enlightening thing i've ever heard and people in the comments are like yeah hats off to you man that's so that's so smart i'm gonna go and check if you know i lose money on wednesdays right okay why you know you're doing that off of off of basically a very small sample size even if it's a year and what you're not doing is you're not eliminating variables you're taking your own performance as if it's gospel truth about how your strategy performs what you need to do is you need to go and look at a historical data set of your strategy and see if your strategy makes money on Wednesdays. And guess what? Oh, it does. So it's just me who doesn't make money on Wednesdays. What happens on Wednesdays that stops me making money? Oh, that's right. I'm at Thai kickboxing for three hours in the morning. I come in shattered for the, you know, the New York session and I put on some stupid trades. Okay, well, you can eliminate that. You know, you can eliminate your own behavior. Or you say, actually, my strategy doesn't make money on Wednesdays but it's only one Wednesday every eight weeks. What happens on one Wednesday every eight weeks? Go and check your economic calendar and you'll see what happens. And then you go, so on that specific day, when that specific event risk comes out, my strategy doesn't work. Then I don't trade when that specific event risk happens. It's actually uh, based on data, right? I think you made a great point. Like too many people will think, oh, if Sam says Wednesdays are the worst days, then they're probably the worst day for me without even looking at their own data. And that can go into something we've discussed before, just how many people don't have data. They don't use any trade tracking software. They're just throwing trades around, which I think you and I are on the same page. Like the people like that, that are just showing up to the market every day, clicking buttons, trying to get this thing through, getting that funding challenge over the line. They're not really trading. They have no rules. They have no system. There's no documentation. Um, do you have any advice for the guys that are in that position? They hear people like us talk about journaling their trades and documenting. What's an easy way to start that? Is there any specific data maybe that you would say, hey, if you don't know these, like your win rate, your strike rate, like if you don't know these points, you really aren't trading. Okay, so I would just say one last thing on the, yeah. the kind of previous point before we come on to some practical tips there. Okay. The reason this is so important is because of what's called overfitting or curve fitting, which is where you effectively 
you your equity curve looks like you know an uptrending zigzag and what you do is you take that historical data and you start tweaking certain parameters in order to make that equity curve as smooth as possible sounds like it makes sense but now what's happened is your equity curve from here to here is just like this most beautiful straight line and now when you apply this strategy going forward it stops working why not because the strategy stopped working but because you've you've tweaked parameters based on a niche within the market and now you're trying to apply that to other market information that it doesn't apply to so as an ex as a practical example when i was testing one of my strategies before we actually launched education on it i was trading 15 pairs and i found that on my in sample data which is like a three year you want to do a symmetrical in, in and out of sample test that's the way i tend to do it anyway I took a three-year end sample, and of these 15 assets I was trading, five of them weren't performing. They were either break-even or they were slightly down. So what I'd done was I went forward into my out-of-sample the next three years with just 10 assets. I removed the five that, that weren't making money. And what I found was the 10 assets didn't perform so well over the out-of-sample. And I thought, that's really strange. You know, I wonder why the strategy just not working all of a sudden okay what happens if i go and add in the other five that i took out of the end sample i add them and going forward the strategy now works better so what i done was i isolated those five assets and i put them on an equity curve of the six year sample the in sample three years the out sample three years and what i found was for the first three years they were downtrending and the next three years they actually aggressively began to uptrend so you can say, you could test a three-year sample and say, yeah, yeah, Aussie yen doesn't work and dollar Swiss doesn't work and gold doesn't work. In the next three years, they may be your top performers. And, you know, a, a guy within our community removed silver from his testing or from his trading after 2022 didn't work. In 2023, silver was our best performing asset. And he's like sitting there and he's, he's you know, I mean, left there like, why did I do that? What he's done is, he's taken something over a small sample and just thought if it doesn't work there, it will never work. Wednesdays could be your best performing day of the week from now until the end of time. Right. And yeah. you could make 90% of your PL on Wednesdays. You, you just don't know. So it, yeah. it's, you compromise your own strategies, integrity and robustness by applying filters based on, on limited market information. It's what really good. Question. Info. I know we'll go yeah. back to that in a second because wait, now I want to go of this. So there are guys in my group in the mentorship now who are, I think, a victim of this curb fitting. They're a victim of, and then also even looking at too small of a, like, like even today, no joke, bro. One of the guys, his name is Andrew. Shout out to Andrew. He's a great guy, not too far from me. Uh, he says, look, I'm losing trades in my back testing and in my actual trading. The data says from 9 to 10 a.m. right at New York Market Open, I am losing. Well, that first question I ask is how many, I mean, trades are in 47 trades or 37 trades. I'm like, bro, that's not enough trades for us to say, oh, you should never trade the open. Mm. Maybe, maybe what I'm, this is just what I'm adding on to what you said. What I have some guys do is I'll have them either demo trade or just mark up and playbook those trades. If they think that that hour is screwing up, because what I, I believe this, I don't know if you agree. Whatever you believe about the markets becomes self-fulfilling. If you believe you're not going to make money on Wednesdays, you're not going to make money on Wednesdays. It's going to – you have to believe in it. So if he right now believes, hey, man, 9 to 10 a.m., it's not working for me. I can kind of compromise and I where I find the middle ground between what you're saying, which is like shut up and get more data and dropping it. The middle ground is – Keep trading, but maybe cut the size or demo it or playbook it and not get into them while we gather more data. Because I think, like you said, a lot of people are victims to too small of a sample size and then making yeah. a decision. So what I was going to get at here is just something else I wanted your opinion on. I have a couple of guys who will do back testing. They will work on their strategy within what we teach. They will refine. They've tested all these different variables. Should it do this? Should it do that? Does this make it more? And they never stop doing that. It's like I have to come in and kick them on the like remind them like, hey, we did enough testing. Let's go trade. Do you have an opinion yeah. on that? Do, do is how do you balance maybe trading and testing at the same time? Is my question. You want a strategy that is as bland as possible. Okay. You want a, you don't want something that's fancy. You don't want something that has absolutely killer results over a period. You want 
the most bland strategy possible, certainly for what I do. What do I mean by that? I, I don't want a 70% strike rate. I don't want to be making five R every single trade. If I find that over a historical sample, you know, it's almost like too good to be true for one, but also what it tells me is, wow, this strategy has performed excellent within this niche. If I go and test that same system on earlier data or later data than I have, typically what you'll find is that something has changed and now it doesn't make money. If you have strat a strategy in testing that goes through long periods of break even, it can sometimes do a six and eight month period of slightly down or break even. A lot of people look at that and go, this strategy is not, not tradable. That to me is a green light because it tells me it tells me that the strategy is not super overfitted for a specific data sample. I can look at my, you know, a six year sample and the strategy makes 150 R, let's say. But in the middle of that six year sample, there's like, let's say an eight month period where it's drawing down and it maybe goes down 14, 15%. I'm perfectly happy with that. I know if I start trying to fit that curve a little bit more sooner or later, something's going to break. You pull something the on the wrong side, right? Mm. Strategy is no longer robust. A strategy with, you know, a 40 to a 50% strike rate, bingo. A strategy that's making average, you know, win-loss relation between your average loss and average profit of two to two and a half. This is what I call like a bland strategy. It's like, it, it makes money. It's not, you know, a superstar strategy, but it makes money. And it's just that workhorse. It's just that thing that's just going to consistently just keep on doing its thing. The, the higher performing the metrics are when you start seeing profit factors of three and four and five and all that kind of stuff. I'm like, that is literally a small market shift away from that strategy to stop and working forever. My strategies tend to have a profit factor anywhere between 1.2 and 1.8. And that's really what I found to be the sweet spot. I am perfectly happy with something that can make me 30 to 50% a year. When you say that win rate, is that the win rate in the back testing, or is that the win rate that you are looking at from the own, your own clicks of the button? When you say I'm looking for the 50% win rate, is, is that 50% in the back testing, and then you're going to use discretion and probably be at 60 or 65, or are you really shooting for 50? No. So my strike rate in testing is probably about 44, 45. So lower. My strike my strike rate in live is, is right around the same. So I would say 45 to, you know, 40 to 50% is like, you know, a strike rate that in testing, I'm like, that's looking pretty sweet. Okay. Um, my testing uh, KPIs and my live KPIs tend to line up, you know, sure. pretty well. Okay. That's what I'm asking. Okay. Let's go to the, uh, the question about balancing testing. So I'm trading, I need to pass funding challenges, but I also want to back test and refine the strategy. Yeah. What would you get? And the answer can't be find more time in the day because everybody, you're about to experience it. You got kids, you got other shit, you got life. How do you, is there a point where you put the testing aside and you say, all right, I, I got enough. Let me go trade for two months and see what I actually do. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, once, you, once you've got something that's producing positive results and you've, I, I'm not a fan of strategy refinement, adding filters and all that kind of stuff, because what it does is it makes a strategy less and less and less robust. You're adding filters on top of filters on top of filters. You say, okay, well, I'm going to put in an EMA here. And if the market's above the EMA, I'll trade. And I'm also going to make that EMA. So EMA is here. I'm also going to make that EMA a 50 period EMA. And guess what? Now it has to happen between these hours of the day. And guess what? It has to happen on this day of the week. And guess what? It has to, and all of a sudden, You've got like, you know what I mean? You've 18 parameters and you're never trading. Yeah, but you're precariously, you may get plenty of trades, right? You may, but you're precariously balancing the strategy success on top of all of these filters. And it's like sooner or later, something shifts in the market and none of these, one of it these filters, yeah, one of these filters is letting you down and you don't know which one it is because you've got 18 of them stacked on top of each other. It's a good point. So, I would apply as, as few filters as you can possibly apply and get the strategy working. Um, you know, so the process, I would always say, come up with an idea. It has to have a statistical framework, i.e., you know, when price does this, there is a 58% probability of it going this, this um, range, you know, one times the range of this pattern, as an example. Okay, so I know there's a 58% chance of it doing one times its own range. 
if I was just to execute that at market price with a stop loss below the range of whatever that pattern is, shooting for one times the range, I instantly have an edge. How can I now go on to a lower time frame, for example, and see how I can get tighter stops in here? See how I can get more precise entries. So, okay, maybe I don't catch every single one, but all of a sudden, you know, my RR is actually increasing. I'm now actually Without getting adding better filters. RR than, than one right? to one. That's what you're saying. Without adding filters, you're just refining what's in front of you already. Yeah. So you're just taking a statistical framework. You're finding entry and exit parameters. Now you go and test that on what's called an in-sample data. Pick a three-year or a four-year period and test it on that data. Now, once you've got that, if it's profitable, set that aside, right? Fantastic. We've got something that's profitable. See if you can apply filters to that sample size to make that strategy slightly better. Try it. Okay, we've got one filter added. And you know what? It's actually making 20R more over that sample size. Great. Now take that new refined strategy and test it on an out of sample data set, another three or four year period and see if it works. If it doesn't work very well, strip off that filter that you added and you might find that it actually does work well. So it doesn't work great, but it works well enough and it works better than it did with the filter. So what you've now found is on your in sample, the strategy worked with the filter, it worked better. But the out of sample with the filter didn't work as well, but without the filter, it did. So now you just strip off the filter and across both samples, you've got something that just works. And right. now you go and now you go and trade that. I'm a big believer in putting money behind what you trade. I'm not a big fan of demo. I'm not a big fan of paper trading. I think you need to be taking heat, you know, and, and whatever it is you're doing, even if it's only a five grand account or something like that, take take the heat and, and feel the pain from it and just be a man and get over it it's numbers on a screen it's you know we sit and look at at little pictures of candles like and we make money from it like don't take it to the point where you're like you know you're pulling your hair out and all that it is what it is right be just okay it's not working strip it back work forward so That's many great people advice. so many people get so uptight they get so consumed you know the thing that people forget is it's a screen you know it's just a screen People get so absorbed into it to the point where it's like their entire life is is hinging upon the the outcome of the next trade. Mm -hmm. Just take a step back and take a breath, man. People people get too uptight about things. They do. I totally agree, and that was very well said. What's your best advice for people that struggle to handle losses in trading? Grow up. Tell me more. <laughs> Look, you you. This is the problem with trading, right? If you're going for a job and you're going to be, you know, we, we, you live in a city, I live in a city, we drive down, down the road and there's drainage at the side of the road, there's power lines, there's all these things. Guys are actually having to go down in those sewers and clean them out, right? Guys are actually going, having to, to pick up your rubbish and take it to a landfill and all that kind of stuff. Guys have to do that. And when they go for that job, right? And they, they fill on the job application. They know what they're getting themselves in for. They know I'm going to be spending the next 20 years in the drains under the ground, you know, unclogging drains. They know what they're getting in for. When you get into trading, that's the problem. You don't have to fill in a job application and say, I, you know, I'm perfectly happy taking losses. I know that my job is going to involve this. Like it or not, the best traders out there, you know, the majority of, of solid traders don't have above a 60% win rate. Right. The majority of solid traders have somewhere around that 50 percent. So you have to recognize you're going to lose money. Yeah, it's going to happen. You're going to take losses. You're going to lose funded accounts. Right. Suck it up. You got you got in for this. Right. If you can't handle the heat, get out of the kitchen. You know, and I don't mean to be dispassionate or to be, you know, um, removed. But sometimes people just need that. And it's all good and well me saying to like the audience or viewers, oh, you know, I'm so sorry to hear you had that loss. And. You know, it's not a family member, it's a trade. Like you're gonna have another one. But as as a matter of practical advice, I guess, yeah. The reason you're impatient in the markets and the reason you're upset about losses is because of your expectations. If if I said to you, let me think about about how I can how I can frame this. If you're anxiously waiting for the next trade and you're desperate to trade. 
this applies to people who are over trading and stuff as well. If you're desperate for the next trade to come, it tells me one thing. You have told yourself that you're going to win. Right? You've told yourself it's going to be a winning trade. That's why you want it to come. If you thought the next trade was going to be a losing trade, you would hope it never comes. Right? So True. Going, right. So instead of expecting the trade to win or expecting the trade to lose, you know, expecting the trade to win and you can't wait for the next trade and you're hinging everything on it or expecting the trade to lose and you're terrified of it coming, just neutralize it. Have no expectations of the next trade. Just recognize the outcome of the next trade is not dependent upon anything. It's just random. The outcome of the next trade, the next sequence of trades is totally random. You yeah. have an edge that works not every time. You have an edge that works over time, as Mark Douglas says. You have an edge that hasn't promised you to make you money on the next 10 trades. It's promised to make you money over the next 100 or 1,000 trades. So just have neutral expectations. The next trade will come whenever it comes. And whatever the outcome will be, the outcome will be. So going into a trade, recognize that you're going to pay, you're either going to pay, let's say your risk of $1,000. You're either going to pay $1,000 to get 2000 back, or you're going to pay $1,000 to learn something. What can you learn from that loss? What can you learn from, you know, about your strategy? Most of the time, it's just experience. You're just learning how to handle the ups and downs of your strategy. So if you had to take $1,000 out of your wallet every time you got into a trade and put it, put it on the desk, you know, people would think about trading a lot differently. Because it's numbers on a screen, they're so happy to rush into just risking a thousand dollars there, and then they lose it, and and it's really psychologically traumatic for them. Yeah. It, understand the risk that you're taking, and understand that the outcome of the next trade isn't promised. Have a totally neutral outlook to it, and then when you lose, you'll say, "Well, I knew there was a fifty percent chance of that happening. If it wins, you'll go, I knew there was a fifty percent chance of that happening." And a lot of the time, in this in this sort of age that we're living in where winning is really glorified in the markets, that's a root problem as well because winning is held in such high esteem. It means that when losing happens, it's like, you know, it, it's like just, just, you're distraught over it effectively. If when you win, don't, don't congratulate yourself. Don't be jumping up and down thinking what a legend I am. You just done your job. You click the buttons and the markets went in your favor, you know, but we, we, we psych ourselves up. We get quite prideful. We pass ourselves, yeah, look at that three hour trade I had. You just done your job and you got paid to do it. You know, no one's like driving home from the office on, you know, the day that they get paid, like come into their wife, like, guess what happened today? I got paid my wages. It's like, right. yep. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's why you work. So when you're win, don't make a big deal about it. It's just, you just got paid for for placing that trade for following your system. And so when you lose, don't beat yourself up about it. It's not your fault that you lost unless you've done something stupid, went against your rules or whatever. But if you're following your system and you lose, as long as you followed your process, you know, equally you've, you've done your job so you can chill out about it. But, you know, um, aversion to losing is a big problem, a big, big problem. People really, really struggle in that area. Yeah. And, first-hand experience I had of it from July 2022 until January 2023 I was negative every single month and subsequently so were you know people following my systems and strategy and people were getting disheartened and all that kind of thing and I think it was in some senses it was reassuring to them that it was water off a duck's back for me but other people who maybe didn't get it as much were perhaps quite quite bitter about that they're like you know we've we've been in drawdown for six months and it seems like this guy doesn't even care but then we go on to have a killer year in 2023 so it's just it's par for the course you sign the job application when you get into this industry you're going to lose money deal with it that was a really good very well said answer to the question i got two more questions for you number one Fantastic. Well, I'll ask, I'll ask it in this order. Number one, what do you think is the amount of time that it takes to learn how to trade? What's the learning curve for somebody that's just coming into the business, even with mentorship? Mm, okay, this is a difficult question to ask, to answer rather. And I'll tell you why. Because KB is very detached from beginners, um, not necessarily by design. When we first 
got into providing education, we we mentored a lot of beginners. It's not something I've done in a long time. So very difficult for me to say. What I can say is for struggling traders out there, if you're struggling, you are months, you're a matter of months away from being profitable, you know, with the right education and mentorship. When we launched our program last year, we had guys within, you know, three, four months doing five figures and payouts from prop firms. We had a number of guys who had who had come in, they'd done X, Y, and Z education, and within a matter of months, they're they're taking home five figures, which you know wow. we're relatively public about the kind of results that our members are doing. But these guys have been in and out of being burned in the markets for three, four years. And ultimately that's good. It's good to have that experience behind you because you have less of a wandering eye when you know your strategy is not performing for a period. You're not like, oh, well, maybe I should go and try something else now. You've already been and done everything else. And um, whereas beginners, you know, if someone's very new and they get the foundations and they were to come into some of my more professional education, they could have great results in a very short period of time within 12 months. And if if they go through a bad period, because they've not been around and tried the other things. In a bad period, they might start to want to go and explore explore something else. But for our professional education, our top level course, the policy that we have is if you haven't made back the cost of the course within 12 months, we just refund you because it doesn't happen. It doesn't so happen. So you, you feel like within months. a year, somebody can really make a big step forward? If they've got the foundations locked down, within 12 months, they're going to make you know, well, our, our top level education is 4K, right? So I know within 12, and I put my money where my mouth is on, on that statement, I know within 12 months, because if they don't, they get a full refund. <laughs> so we're we're confident in our, our approach, but we just know that it works. So yeah. if someone's got the foundations, but we also, that's why we interview people for our, our PAC course. It's why we go through an application process. We only take on people who've got the foundations established, who we know we're going to get results out of within 12 months. So... Yeah. Yep. Same thing with, with our, our high ticket mentorship is 12 weeks, four grand. That price is going up, but the same thing we interview them. It's got to be for the right person. I think because what we're both saying is as a new trader, the amount of time it will take you to get the foundations down just depends on how much free time you have. Once you get the foundations down and you do get with mentorship or with a coach or someone with a little more experience, I agree. Within a year, you can make huge leaps and bounds. I wouldn't have a 12-week program if I thought it would take you more than three months, four months to really start to see some success. And like I think that you guys as well do it, do it really professionally, like you said, not just selling the beginner the dream of like, hey, man, first month you're going to make 10 grand and you're going to love this business. That would be great if everybody – that happened to everybody, but that just is not the case. Yeah, yeah. There's All right, no last question. <laughs> There'll be no money left. What are you looking forward to most about being a dad? Oh, man, I'm so – I'm so excited. Like I am I am unbelievably excited. I was like – I was driving along in my car today. And, you know, I was coming back from getting my, get my hair cut. And I was just thinking about like, just holding her and just like sitting her on my knee and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, all the, I, I, I don't know, man, it's just, I'm lost for words when I think about it. I'm so, I'm just so excited to have, to have my kid around. And the way I described it to, to my wife, Neve was, you know, when you were a kid and you'd get like a new toy for Christmas, right? and or for your birthday or whatever and you go to bed and you wake up in the morning and you're kind of lying there and then you remember that you've got a toy and you're like you know you want to run and go and play with it you know it's a new bike or whatever you're that's like that's exactly oh. how it is bro that's exactly so me and my wife will be sitting there sometimes and we'll be like should we go wake him up like i'm bored i want to hang out with him i know so and that's what i was thinking about it's like you know times where i'll be sitting at my desk or whatever working and all that and i'll be like you know i've, I've maybe got a bit of free time and i'm like oh, I have a baby. Yeah, I'm just going to go and run and like hang out with her. But it's the, the things I'm looking forward to. I want to see what she looks like. You know, she's been terrorizing my wife for the past nine months. So, I've, you know, obviously we need to start off with me having a, taking her side, having a word with her, get her into trouble, you know. Um, <laughs> but no, listen, there's, there's so much to look forward to. And whenever you post you know pictures of your little one and that kind of thing on twitter i'm always showing neve 
like that one of him like crawling to grab her. Yeah, yeah I'm just that. a couple months ahead of you, bro. So I, I know exactly what you're saying, 100. percent I because I was the same way. I had a buddy that had a kid a couple of months ahead of me, and I was like, look, his kid's moving. Tom, one of the guys I work with, same thing. Like I met his kid after he was just born. So it's amazing. I'm curious to know as as time goes on, bro. Like next time we sit down and do a podcast, I'm going to ask you first. Did you feel the motivation that everybody talks about when they first, you know, some people say like, I see the kid for the first time and now I got this new motivation. I'm going to make $10 million a week. I didn't have that. So I'm curious to know if it happens for you. I think it probably won't. It's going to be my guess just because you're such a motivated and disciplined guy. Now it's like, what is a kid going to do? This is just the next step in you building your, your story, your journey, your, your family, you know, there, there is an element of that, you know, definitely already where I'm like, I, I want to be you know, it's not enough to just make six figures in a month. I want to be doing that every single month. You know what I mean? Of course. Um, and I want, you know, to, I just want, to, want my kids to have, have as, as much as I can give them really. I want to thank you guys for watching this far into the video. If you are not a member of ASFX, if you're living under a rock or maybe on Mars, I'm offering you 25% off our starter pack and access to our Discord chat with the link flying in above my head. Use the card to save 25% on the starter pack, you're going to learn four back-tested strategies. And like I said, you're going to get access to join us, trade with us in our Discord chat. Now let's get back to the video. That That's going to be for their benefit. You know, I'm not saying I'm going to spoil them or whatever, but I want my kids to have plenty of experiences. I want them to have plenty of time with mom and dad. And, you know, a big part of that is, you know, I'm, I'm 24, right? So I'm, I'm still relatively young. But a big part of that is saying, you know what, actually, you're not young now. You have a kid. So it's, it's easy to just people can be 25, 26, 27, 28 and still be young because right. you've not got any responsibilities or whatever. No you become a man. You become a man when you take a wife and, and you've got a kid. So it's there's some definitely some maturing to be done there. Um, you know, physically, mentally, spiritually, definitely, there's now a added responsibility that needs to be taken on. And I'm I'm ready for the challenge, you know. Um and, and so, I mean, I'm, I'm just really looking forward to it. I, I just really am. awesome, bro. You got family near you too, right? Grandparents are going to be nearby. They, they will be. I mean, maybe like a 30 minute drive, something That's like not that. Bad. It's, it's, it's not far away. No, my not, mom's not two not hours far. away. She, she, I have to FaceTime my mom with my son all the time because she wants to see him so bad every day. So yeah, yeah. Take advantage of that too while having everybody close. But listen, bro, wishing you and the family the best of luck with the delivery, with the baby, wishing you the best of luck this year with the trading. And uh, I can't thank you enough, bro. Every time we chat, I hope that I do a good job at asking you some interesting questions because you you have a lot of value to share. Even though you're young, still has a lot of experience, a lot of value, a lot of wisdom to share. And I know yeah. the audience really appreciates it, bro. So what I'll do, I'll put your, uh, I guess we'll send them to Twitter. Is that the best spot? You're not the most Twitter, active Instagram, on Instagram. Whatever. Twitter, yeah. Instagram. I'll put those both down in the description. We'll make sure everybody can connect with you. But for now, We'll put a pin in it. I'm sure we'll do another one of these in a little bit. So can't thank you enough, Sam. For our listeners, we're going to sign off here. Make sure you guys are subscribed. We'll see you guys next week in the next episode. And Sam, thank you again, brother. No problem.